Hello, everybody. Welcome to Trader Merlin for your hump day. It is Wednesday. Exciting day out there. We've got Tiger Berry joining us. What, what an honor to get the Kansas City royalty to join us. Tiger, good to have you with us. Glad you could uh, join us live for once. i got Les, John DiNardo. David, we, I'm seeing all you all over the place today, man. Starting a session this morning. We see you here. It's uh, good to have you guys. Tomasina, Giselle as well. We've got uh, Tony Pepe. Dana, Drew, Alex, congratulations on your Astros. Impressive win there. And uh, you're what? You're up against the Red Sox next. It's some, wouldn't it be great to see you against Steve in the World Series? I would love it. Anyway, I hope that happened. Jimmy T, Jeff, and Jerry as well. Uh, good to have everybody here with us today. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about. I, uh, I'm glued to my screen over here watching cryptocurrencies right now. As some of these ones are just actually going crazy in my portfolio. Loving it. And could do it. Good to see you as well. Um... Let's see, what do I want to start with today? Uh, I had some housekeeping stuff that I wanted to get out of the way, but I forgot and I can't remember what it was. So we'll just have to dive right into today's show and get on with the process. So here's what I want to talk about to start with Jeff, who I think that might actually be Jeff here with us today. He sent in a question, more uh, a comment really says, the Turtles use a syndicator called the Don Chain Channel. I don't have that on Thinkorswim or TradeStation. Have you ever seen slash used it? Well, I have, and therefore I figured we would talk about trading Don Chain channels. Now, before we get into Don Chain channels, what they are, how they work, I, I think everybody here understands my hierarchy of trading tools or utility. Number one, price, right? You should always be looking at price. That's the most important thing. Your trade should be based off of where price is and what price is doing. Now, if you want to add on different layers of validation of support to help you through that process, then sure, go look at a lot of these different indicators. I think they can be useful, but most of the time you can get all the information that you need from the price chart. And Don Chain or Don uh, Don Chain channels are no different. Everything that is derived into that indicator is taken from a price chart. So it, once you understand how it's constructed and what it's telling you, you probably won't need to look at it anymore, but I will show you. And um, yeah, day of the dot, right? 20, we're at 25% today. Boom, boom, moving that one up my portfolio. So let me walk you through the basics of what Dawn Chain channels are. I'll give you a little brief history and then I'll show you an application, how you might want to use these and you know, add them to your, your repertoire, if you will. So I'll start off with a, a little bit of an un a channel here. There you go. You've got uh, T Cruise. I'm not sure if it is price channel. There's varying degrees of price channels. So there's like probably 15 different versions of quote unquote price channels. I'd have to look in um, Thinkorswim to see if it's actually a Don Chain channel, but we can, you know, I guess once you understand this, you can go verify, I guess. So basically this guy was a commodities futures trader. He was really kind of the father of managed futures many, many moons ago, uh, 1905 to 1993. He just looks like he would be uh, the, the super geek. This, this to me reminds me of like a Scott McCormick if he was around back in the early 1900s. This is what Scott McCormick would look like. Just a nerd, but so smart and brilliant at what he did. Of course, I'm going to get hate mail from Scott McCormick now. That's Scott McCormick's Halloween costume, by the way. I'm just kidding. So here's the basics of Don Chain Channel. It's extremely simple to understand. It looks confusing on a price chart, but once you know the math and how it's calculated, extremely simple. First, start with a candle. And I'm using black and white candles because it's just easier for me to see. Black candle, obviously, it had a down day for whatever time period this was. What a Don Chain Channel does is it says, let's take three components. Number one is your highest high. So I just mapped a little blue line or a black line across the high. It takes the middle channel, which is really taking the high and the low and dividing by two. So you can see in red there, I've mapped out the low for that candle and I mapped out the high and then the middle is simply take those two numbers, add them together, divide by two. That's all it is. Very simple, right? It totally look like Larry David here, right? Okay. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Those lines won't change until something happens. So for example, let's say this is a daily time frame. What it'll do is it's going to keep these lines here for X amount of bars. In this case, the default for Don Chain is 20. So it's going to use 20 candlesticks worth of data to formulate the calculation. If it does not break this high or this low for the next 20 candles, it will look exactly like this. It's just simply going to stay perfectly horizontal. So for example, next candle slightly up, you know, down near the bottom of the range, these lines are not going to change. 
Second candle, looking great, looking strong, starting to pick up, maybe it bounce off demands on who knows, but starts to rally up a little bit, but still those lines won't change because it has not made a new high or a new low. Again, until those change, nothing's gonna happen. So you can see I'm kind of just going fast forward here. You know, nothing has changed. All of a sudden we get this candle right here that breaks out and notice that those lines adjust. The bottom one has not changed its slope at all. The bottom line is perfectly horizontal, why? Well, because it hasn't made a new low, but it has made a new high, so this all of a sudden starts to adjust for the high. So you'll never ever have something outside the upper Don Chain channel, right? Because it's always taking the highest high. However, you will see the middle line here is sloping upward because it's now taking this new high plus that old low dividing by two. Pretty simple. It really is not a, a groundbreaking piece by any means. So what does this look like on a price chart? Well, let me bring it up for you. So here's Polkadot, which is bouncing all over the place right now. Let's go to, let's just go to the indexes because that might be an easy reference. So here's our S&P 500. We've already got some lines on there. Let me see, maybe I can get rid of those lines by going to SPY, but I think I marked that one up as well. We've got lines all over the place. All right, so here we have the SPY and I think everybody here can see very clearly strong uptrend. Well, maybe it can clue us into potential trend changes. And you have to understand that this guy, um, Richard Donchain, was a trend trader. And I, you know, so you look at some of the most successful traders in the history of financial markets, they're trend traders, generally looking at the bigger long-term time frame trends. So uh, I know initially, Jeff, you'd mentioned the turtles, right? The Turtles are kind of a famous investing group. I encourage you guys to go check them out. There's a lot of books about the Turtles that you can get for free. Just go to Google and you can type in the name of the book and then space.pdf and you can usually download a lot of these books. All right, um, I think there's actually one that's called the Turtle Trading Tactics. So um, if you look at turtletradingtactics.pdf, that will kind of show you their whole strategy, which is a nice momentum uh, trend following strategy. So. Yeah, yeah, Jerry, kind of like Richard Dennis, right? Most of these old Chicago floor traders, and you know, you look at somebody like a Bob Dunn as well, it's about the trend. That's where you get the biggest, most powerful, long-standing moves if you step back and just go with the trend. So this is that, this is a trend following tool. So here is your SPY. I don't think anybody needs me to, to draw lines on here to tell you that this thing is in a strong uptrend. Granted, it looks like it's getting a little weaker right now. But if I throw on this DC20, which is the Don Chain channel, You'll notice something somewhat interesting. It has been making higher highs, higher highs, higher highs. All of a sudden, really starting about September 30th, it just started to make some lows. And, and this is where, depending on how you utilize Don Chain, it could be giving you signals for a trend reversal. And, and why is that? Well, the way that people use this as a signal, and by the way, these are the, the color codes. I change the colors just because it's easier on my eyes. So I've got that upper, um, upper high is in black, I've got the lower low in red, and then I have this little blue line here, which is basically taking those two, dividing it by, uh, adding them together and dividing by two. <laughs> Tom, the Turtles were a band. Yes, the, there's a, uh, a very famous group, by the way, and, and Tom, I know you're kind of the engineer type, you probably would love it. Um, the story of the Turtles is one of the best trading stories out there. For those that don't know, Richard Dennis and Bill Eckhart were two traders on the floor of uh, the Chicago, I think the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And Richard Dennis says, I could take anybody off the street, anybody, regardless of background, and make them a successful trader. And Bill Eckhart was like, no, no way, man. It's in my DNA. I was born to do this. And Dennis says, all right, I'll bet you. And they made a wager that uh, they could take somebody off the floor and turn them into successful traders. They ran ads in different publications, not just financial publications, and basically did an interview process and looked for people, signed them up, and basically they said, you have to follow this set of rules. Uh, better than trading places, believable direction. Way better than trading places. I, I guess you're right. It kind of was that same basic theme, right? Um, yeah, Mortimer and uh, I can't remember the other guy's name from trading places, but Mortimer, what a great name. Similar. So... Um, <laughs> you guys are great with your comments today. So the the uh, bet was, again, that you can make a successful traders. They basically said you have to follow these rules. And what they did is similar to what, you know, what I do when I was teaching classes is I would give more flexibility to those who are following rules. So when you're trading live, um, you know, on my trading academy's stock class or core strategy back in the day, 
you're trading live with real money. And of course, we had very tight stop losses. You're trading, you know, very uh, small amount of shares just to have some skin in the game and get that emotional feel of actually having a real trade. Because as you know, you trade in simulator, I can hit a, um, a refresh button and turn, delete everything, it doesn't matter. Real life, it's uh, very different. So ultimately what they did is they, they found some people that follow the rules, they increased their share size or their account size and gave them you know, millions of dollars to trade. And you know history has proven that they have become some of the most successful traders out there simply by following a plan and rules. And I think that that's where indicators like the Don Chain channel work is because there are specific rules. There you go, Randolph, thanks for the, uh, Randolph and Mortimer. I'm gonna have to watch that movie again this weekend just for fun. <laughs> So there you go, that's the basics of the turtles. Interesting to check them out. Uh, I believe there's one called The Turtle Trading Tactics, which is a book I just, I made it about halfway through and I just kind of gave up because I get it, it's trend tools and just establishing rules. So how would you trade this one? Well, the main thing here is it's a directional tool. So you really wanna be going with the trend. So when you see something kind of breaking out, th that's technically for them buy points. So how, how would they be using this? Well. Let me go back a little bit because we all know what happened. And I guess I could I could pick a different security and just randomize it for you. But really what they're saying is you shouldn't be buying into it until it um, bounces and makes new highs. That's your entry point. And generally when something is trending to the upside, like it is right now, they're saying that your, your trigger to be going short and getting um, short is right here, which we achieved on September 20th when we made a new low. We really hadn't been making any new lows um, on the s p well now we have and the key here is to stay with that trend until it breaks that upper band right oh yeah jamie lee curtis and that goodness gracious the, the the fantasies of young boys for many years after that show so it's all about rules and in one way that you can enhance your success with this is if you're using don chain or any real trend following tool i think you take a step back and you look at the granddaddy the, the best of them all which is moving averages so we'll go back and i'll add on let's say uh, 200 period moving average here, which is certainly lagging, very lagging, but it's giving you the overall idea of where we should be. So in this case, even though the Don Chain channel is saying to sell and actually maybe go short because now all of a sudden we're making new lows and, and making consecutive new lows, it's really more about staying with it until this 200 period moving average rolls over. It's simply a probability piece. And that's kind of my own little addition to uh, trend following tools like this, even Bollinger Bands, right? If I'm looking to go short on Bollinger, Bollinger Bands, and, and I'll make the comparison here in a second, um, I want to make sure that that moving average is rolling over because right now the odds are this is going to continue to go up because the trend is that way. So the 200 period might be a bit long term for you. You could change this and maybe go to 100, which obviously cuts this in half. And then we can look and you'll see it's still trending upward, right? Don't worry about it breaking down below the moving average. That's not important. It's really the, the, the change in picture. Now, at this point right here, if we had that 100 on and we're using this Don Chain, Don Chain channel, you can see that it, it's now making a new low on the Don Chain. So essentially it's saying you should be exiting your long positions. For me, that also means you could potentially be going short. Now it also bounced right off the 100 period moving average and now all of a sudden we're below it. So this is actually setting up to show more negativity on the SPY. So I still have a second half of my puts to, <laughs> that I haven't gotten out of. Um, I'll, I'll rely on this maybe as a decision support tool, but it's starting to show more negativity. The only thing that's not working for me with regards to the Don chain is the moving average still is trending up on pretty much every moving average. I see even the 20, well, the 20 is gonna be pointing down, right? You can see the 20 is dripping down right here. And that's just because the last 20 days has been predominantly down. So the question is, you know, do you use it? Should you use it? Well, I think it's definitely one that might be helpful for some of you. The problem I have with this indicator is a lot of people are using it to make their trading decisions for them. And, and I think that the, the price should be the main piece. So for example, if you look where we are right now, and I'll, I'll take the Don chain off. If I'm looking at where I think this market may stop and bounce, well, I do have some areas for myself and we won't go really into core strategy here, but you know, this is a spot where I think it might bounce. Why? Well, we had a real aggressive turnaround. We had a, a sharp sell off and then it ripped out of there aggressively. And notice we have been bouncing off it over the past couple of weeks. So to me, this is probably that final piece, the final line in the sand. And if we can get below this, then 
you know, my bias has to change. My bias has to turn into short selling and uh, certainly exiting some long positions, but mainly opening up new short selling positions. So I'm more a, a fan of using things like Don Chain channels or Bollinger Bands in conjunction with supply and demand. So if I find a good demand zone and you know Don Chain is saying you should probably get out and it's coming into demand, I'm not getting out yet. Right, so I'm, I'm overriding the Don Chain signals simply by using the demand zone. Does that make sense, everybody? You should always, to me, supply and demand takes absolute priority over whatever any indicator is telling you. Buy, sell, hold, or indifferent. Just look at what um, supply and demand zones are telling you. So let's go to a different security, one that I never look at, Apple. All right, so I can tell you right now some basic things about the Don Chain channel. Right now, we are seeing the Apple shares with the Don Chain have been on a fairly decent uptrend, not as good as the S&P, but now all of a sudden, the Don Chain is going to be making lower lows. How do I know that? Because you look the last 20 bars or so, it's been making new lows. So it's just simply trending down, trending down. Exactly, John. He says, uh, John Donato says, Don Chain seems to be like a tr uh, trend enhancer, but reward risk is a big factor. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think so. <laughs> Yep, there's this, the appearance of my yellow box. <laughs> I think that's what I'm going to be for Halloween. I'm just going to be a yellow box, and only you guys will get it. <laughs> All my friends will be like, who the hell is this guy? You, you're a yellow box. So let's put them on here. And again, if you really want to learn indicators, the easiest thing to do is to get a piece of paper and write down, okay, this is what the indicator is telling me and how it's constructed. And then you put it on a couple charts and you look at it. After that, look at the price chart first, and then tell yourself, what would the indicator be telling me, right? So if I look at this right now, what's going to be happening is this is, I don't know how many bars, but it's, I'm pretty sure this is more than 20 bars ago. September 8th is more than 20. So what it will be showing me is all of a sudden the top of my channel is going to be dropping because prices have been making lower highs and the bottom will be dropping. So we're going to see this thing trending down. There you go, right? So you're seeing both of them trend down rather aggressively. I didn't need to put these on there. I could just look at price once I know what um, what the math behind Don Chain channels are. And it's very similar. Um, I've, it may actually not allow me to do this. I think I let's go turn off Don Chain. Notice Bollinger Bands are telling us almost the same thing. The difference between these two is that Don Chain will lock and hold a high for a while. You can see that right here on Bollinger Bands, it rolled over and started to come down rather quickly. Whereas if I put the Don Chain, it stays up there for a while. And I actually like the visual of this better because it tells you kind of here's where the high was and giving you a 20 day window or 20 bar window where it's gonna stay that way, All right? You got a 147, let's, let's throw it on there for you. 147.50 supply zone. I would say that's the peak of it, right? You get this little guy right here, that's what you're addressing. You want a yellow box? Let's throw a yellow box on there. All right, so if we do something like this, you know, now you can have yourself a little zone and, you know, looking at what the Don Chain channel is telling me, it's telling me that right now we're seeing sell-off pressure. We're seeing downward movements in it. And forget that this is Apple. Um, no, I don't think it's Wendell's expertise. I mean, Wendell is RSI. Um, he, he's, he loves RSI. Granted, you know, he's a chartered market technician. So Brandon's a CMT as is Scott McCormick and others. So it's not like he's not an expert in these. There's just so many different indicators. But bottom line is I'm just trying to give you some simple rules. In this case here, it would be telling me that if it rallies back up to this, you know, 147 mark, 146.75, somewhere in there, I'd be looking to short Apple. It seems almost sacrilegious to say it. But you know, that's what it's showing me right now. You got a nice little supply zone. You got the trend coming down on price. Granted, our bigger term, tr longer term trend is up. I still have my moving average on here, which is conflicting my decision to go short, right? Moving average is still moving to the upside. But the more that Apple traverses sideways and starts to chop, what you're going to get is this is going to flatten out real quick. And it'll flatten very quickly, primarily because of this move that happened from July th or June 3rd to July 16th. This huge run up here in a certain amount of days will all of a sudden, remember, a 100 day moving average or 50 day moving average is using a specific window of time. So let's just, and I, I don't know, let me see if I can actually calculate this out. I don't know if it'll show me 200 days. 
I want to see if I can get 200 days with it. Yeah, it doesn't tell me how many days is on this, unfortunately. Text, style, uh, show bars, show, there we go, bars. Okay, so I'll do a 100 day moving average, which brings us to right there. All right, so you can see that in another two weeks, it's going to start the, this yellow box, which uh, I'll take away from my supply demand zone. This is the, the amount of bars that are calculated in that 100 period moving average. So as soon as this moves forward, right, this is 100 bars worth of data. As soon as this box moves forward, you'll start to see that data that it'll disappear, right? So once it starts to move up here, all of a sudden that when we get to here, notice that up move is now completely erased. And when that happens, so by the time we get to December 6th, that entire move will be gone. Does that make sense, everybody? So yeah, once we get to December, I mentioned December 6th, this entire up move will be gone, and that 100 period moving average will now not will now not only be going sideways, it'll be drifting down, and, and that assumes that we kind of chop sideways here or, or you know move slightly up or slightly down. But if you take this big move out, all of a sudden things start to roll over. I'm hoping that makes sense, everybody out there. Oh, NJ, thank you, my friend. Appreciate that. Love it. Uh, yes, and you know here's another thing, you know. I meant to bring this up on the show the other day. I just and I get my I get pulled in so many directions with thoughts. The way my brain works. Um, another thing that you could be looking at here is not only that that it's starting to trend down, but a lot of times when markets start to roll over, you can look at the the leaders of these companies, and lo and behold, they may be selling shares. And Mar Margaret's totally right. Uh, Tim Cook sold not only did he sell some, he unloaded a lot. So how do we know that? Well. Let's go to something like Finviz, right? You guys see here, you got Finviz. Uh, you'll see one that says Insider, or you can just type in the symbol for Apple. Apple, boom, hit enter. It brings out a really cool little profile sheet for you of almost everything to do with Apple. So here you can see all the basic statistics. You can see all the different upgrades and downgrades. Everybody's talking outperform. Uh, ooh, one actually downgraded it on September 1st, but almost everybody else is upgrading. Recent news. And then some basic fundamentals. And then here is what I like. Down at the bottom, I know it's kind of hard to see. Let me zoom in for you guys. You have the most recent transactions. So the chief operating officer, the coup, Mr. Jeffrey Williams, just sold 165,000 shares for $23 million. Now, sometimes what you'll see here is it'll say options expiration. And they basically are exercising options. That's no big deal, right? That's normal. But what you're looking at here is different than that this this look all this is sales you've got nothing but sales going on right now at apple right this would show you buys and sells but this is just basically showing you um you can see on this one nobody's buying at apple and here is your chief operating officer april 5th he sold another 133,000 shares so you know he's he's raking in some serious money just made 23 million tim cook was interesting here's your chief executive officer timothy cook he sold 2.3 million shares for a total of 354 million dollars really makes me feel like an idiot that i'm working my butt off and, and not making that much money like where i could have just started a company but anyway uh he still has 3.2 million shares so let's not get too teary-eyed uh, thinking about what he's doing but you know this is kind of interesting seeing that almost everybody on their payroll at least on this screen here is selling shares now timothy cook sold out at 148 oh really where was 148 so he sold out right here. This is actually probably his sale right here because that's the 2 million shares. Um, nice market timing. You know, who knows if this is the top in fact put in, but anytime I see a lot of prominent insiders selling, the, that makes me feel like the top might be in. And you can pull this up for a lot of different companies as well. So big picture, it's still trending up, right? We've got Apple looking great. It's in an uptrend. It's come back down to your moving average line here, but it's making some lower highs and lower lows. So this might be the bend at the end we always talk about. You add on something like these Don Chain channels, and it's actually kind of giving you a little bit more confirmation because now you can see through the Don Chain channels, it's starting to break some new lows and the high is trending down aggressively. So it doesn't mean it's the end. I just really think that it's going to be. Um, you know, again, decision support tools. 
let's see, John, what do you say? They're not selling because of grocery inflation. No, no. And, you know, it's funny. Uh, if you look at the timing of Tim Cook's sales, so here it was August 25th. Remember, that's when everyone was really, like, up in arms talking about the supply, potential supply shortage and going into the holidays. So to me, what this just says is Tim Cook was like, we're not going to be able to get chips for our phones. We're going to have a bad holiday season. I'm unloading some shares. You know, in hindsight, we'll never know. That's just my jaded, skeptical opinion of the entire financial system that everybody's lying and cheating and stealing. <laughs> um, but that, that's how it will uh, hopefully um, give you guys some little bit of edge or insight into how these guys are trading, what it looks like, and what the insiders are doing, which I love. Uncle Sam is glad to hear you sold $23 million. Yeah, but you know what? He'll probably do something else so he can... He'll do find some tax way that he won't pay taxes on that money. Just the nature of the beast. Anyway, um, that's a resource I definitely encourage you guys to check out. It's insider selling. I don't talk about it too much. But, you know, the, the question of Don Chain, do they work? Sure, absolutely. I think you increase your odds of using Don Chain by keeping it with the trend. So if you are, uh, if it's a uptrending market, then I think that you want to obviously be looking for buying opportunities. If it's a downtrending market, you should be looking for selling opportunities. Now, a lot of times they will use these and say it's it's designed to be a turning point indicator. Okay, well, you know, if you're using this right now and saying I'm waiting for this to make some new lows to short, okay, it's giving you some signals. Um, how long do we hold on to that opinion? You hold on to it until you're proven wrong and you hit your stop losses and you're out. So, you know, this could be the beginning of the rollover. Who knows? I I actually would be more inclined to think we're going to see more downside movement in Apple simply because of supply shortage, seeing all the insiders selling, seeing the price extremely elevated right now, and uh, maybe some regulatory issue down the pipeline. It just seems likely that that might be the case. But anyway, trade at your leisure how you see fit. Um, let's see. Oh, yes, of course. It would be wonderful to see the same things with members of Congress. Uh, Congress, uh, Don't get me started. Mm -mm -mm. And what else? Walter says, being a CEO of a company would be like eagle, illegal insider trading because you know for sure what's going on in your company. So you buy. Yeah, so there. Are, just so you know, there are a lot of rules and things they can and cannot do. So they can't do certain trading before big announcements. But, you know, if you're smart as a CEO, what you do is you schedule these things in advance. So it's like you schedule a sale. Now, what they have to do is they have to file certain documentation with the regulators, with the SEC. So if you're an insider like Timothy Cook, he would have to fill out forms and says, I'm going to sell these. And then once it's approved, he can make, make a transaction. So that transaction we saw in August was most likely, or people already knew about it, right? He already filled out the paperwork for it. That said, if you are just because he filled out the paperwork doesn't mean he has to sell. So if I'm a CEO of some corporation, I could go out there and say, I'm going to sell every three months, quarterly, right? And I'll do it, you know, three weeks before my earnings announcement. I do it every year. It's just my scheduled, uh, you know, it's my, my normal sell time. And then you could argue this is your normal practice. And, of course, you do know what's going on with your company. You do know they're going to have some supply chain shortages or things like that. So to me... Um, yeah, I'm very skeptical. Drew, how does Finviz get that info on who is trading those shares? Uh, it's public knowledge. So I believe if we go out here, I think you can actually click on it and see the document. Let me scroll down here. On some sites, uh, you can go here on Timothy Cook. Oh, there it was. We just had it. But you see right here, it says uh, section form four. You can click on this. Boom. And here's the actual filing document of when he did it. All right, so you can go and see when they decide to do it. Um, transaction, date of earliest transaction, so 824. So this was, I don't know when this was actually submitted, but 824 is the earliest he could sell. So he could sell any time after that, and you can see the different transactions that happen. Um, but yes, it's all very public knowledge. And he has somebody, oh, he's got an attorney, of course. We can make that much money, you can have an attorney doing it for you. And there's all the little details in here, explanations of responses and all that stuff. But yes, it's they have to file a document. You can see here, th this is all of Timothy Cook's transactions. Right? Going back years, you can see um, multiple years worth of transactions here. Man. But this recent one, okay, let, let's just start back here at the bottom, right? Let's scroll back, and I want to see what year this was. So on March 26th, and the year was 2008. Ooh, lordy. Okay, guys, if this doesn't tell you that something, the writing's on the wall, I don't know what does. So um, this legal document here is showing his sales 
back to 2008. So let's refresh here. And I'm just going to scroll up and I want you to notice this column here. This is the, the total amount of the sale, All right? So you've got 11 million, 15 million, 36 million, 64 million. The most you see on the screen so far is 64 million. Here's 24 million. And again, now we're probably up into 2010, 11. Here's 54 million. Notice the recent one, 354. That's basically him going, yeah, I don't see much upside. I'm out. I'm bailing. So, uh, you know, I, I knew he had sold some. I didn't know he sold that much. That's a pretty substantial position there that he's unloading in uh, Apple and conveniently at all time highs. Um, who is to say that people handling the paperwork don't use that to sell an advanced suit? Yeah, absolutely, Alex. Uh, 100%. I mean, if you're at the SEC and you get a document that says Tim Cook's going to be selling, uh, you know, 2.3 million shares of Apple, kind of like, hey, Dad, uh, you might want to unload your Apple shares. Or, hey, or I'm going to call up my buddy, uh, Mr. Jerome Powell, <laughs> or the, uh, what was his name? Um, oh, the, you know, the two guys, Rosencrantz and from the Fed guys who got busted. You know, those guys could get busted. Anyway, um, interesting to see that size and that kind of volume from Timothy Cook. And that's just Timothy Cook. You know, you could go back here and you remember I went down this list. If you wanted to see what somebody else was doing, like here's your chief operating officer, you know, you can click on his name, Jeffrey Williams, and see all of his transactions as well. And you can see he's been pretty consistent. Um, God, look how much money this guy's making. Ugh, it just kills me. Making lots and lots of transactions. So I mentioned earlier there's the one of exercising options. So a lot of times this is no big deal. They just get options and they'll do that regularly. He was senior vice president. Move up to chief operating officer. Cool. Let's see. Um, is an insider an individual that owns 5% of trade I, mm, Good question, Margaret. I don't know that. I, I don't know. I'm not... Um, I'm not exactly sure what the cutoff is. I know if you are a director, regardless of how much you own, so if you are a on the C level on the corporate side, so you are a CFO, COO, CMO, those types of roles, you're automatically considered an insider, right? Because you are privy to all that document. So, um, you know, for example, I'm not a chief operating officer or anything like that. So. Timothy Cook had to report Nike option sales. Uh, he may have something to do with Nike. I don't know the logistics behind that, but it, number one, there's, there's a couple reasons that you would have to report. If you own over a certain amount of shares of a company, you have to also report that as well. I think it's 5% for that one. Um, and he may have some working relationship, but what we can do here, let's go to Nike and see when he did that little transaction, shall we? So let's go down here and check out um, so he's not considered an insider because I don't see any Timothy Cook uh, on this one. But um, there might be, uh, not necessarily insiders, there's a major holders one, but I don't know if we can get that information from this site. Let's go insider, yeah, top top 10, yeah. Um, let's just click that and let's see if it gives me NKE. Yeah, unfortunately it's not gonna let me uh, whittle down to the the depth that I wanted. Um, I'm not sure what I showed there, but uh, he might be. I don't. I don't know. Um, I don't really follow Nike, so unfortunately, that's uh, outside of my understanding. But there, there might be a Timothy Cook on the board. He, who knows? You know, he may have some shares. Don't know. Kind of like um, Steve Jobs having shares of all kinds of other companies as well. Remember, he was in Pixar and. Nike was hidden in one of the lines. Well, let me see. Do this real quick. I don't want to spend too much time on this bad boy. So let's go to NKE. And I don't see Nike. No. Well, either way. Um, let's move on. You guys can research that one if you want. I, I, I got other things I need to get to. Here's Apple. Yeah, Timothy Cook. Oh yeah, there, there you go. We've got Nike and Apple. So my guess is, so he's a director. So Timothy Cook is a director at Nike as well. Did not know that. It looks like he's been there a while. He's been making, 
it, what an insult to injury. It's not like he's making enough money. He's out there now doing deals with uh, Nike as well. Hmm, interesting. All right, let me um, let me go to some other questions. And actually, I want to show you this stuff first because this is important. This is kind of what happened out there today. Uh, you guys might remember I was feeling pretty pessimistic on consumer price index, feeling we'd see that number be higher than normal. And the expectations were we we're going to come out at 0.3%. We came out at 04 My gut was saying we'd be like 05 or 06 based off what producer price index did uh, the previous month. And I'll show you producer price index here in just a second. Now, as far as earnings go, this was interesting because you had pretty big beats by almost everybody. Look, BlackRock down there beat by 14% and they were slightly up, you know, just about 4%. But JP Morgan at the top, they beat by a large amount. They had a 25% beat on earnings. They came out with $3.74 versus three bucks and they were down 2.61%. So clearly something in that press conference afterwards in the shareholder meeting um, made people feel a little pessimistic on JP Morgan's prospects. And let's see if we can look at JP Morgan. JPM, here is your daily chart of JPM. Let me get rid of my uh, <laughs> Don Chain channels. But all in all, still looking very good for JP Morgan, but obviously a very uh, decent couple of down days for them, going from about 171 all the way to current price of 161. So a $10 drop in just three days. Uh, also doing rather well number wise was Delta Airlines, DAL, but notice down almost 6% on the day for, oop, you don't even get to see those numbers because I have it on the other screen. But here's your Delta Airlines, which doesn't look as good. It really looks like it's chopping sideways, and it's based off of this number here. They double their earnings expectations, but guys, they're only making 30 cents per share. That's really not great, um, considering where they were in the past. Um, I mentioned BlackRock. You've got First Republic as well, beating, and those are kind of the major pieces that reported earnings today. Um, so that said, what time much time I got? Um, I want to get to some other questions that might be a little off topic, but let's see if we can do it. Um, I think that this was from Mike. I think this is from Mike. I, maybe I didn't change the name. I don't remember. No, it's not from Mike. I was just using a template. So uh, he says, what do you think about Anchor? A-N-C-T. My brother says he took a flyer on it, just like you said. You take a flyer every now and again if you agree with him, uh, but he'd like to get my opinion on it. What about this one? Is it a flyer in mine? Okay. So it's not ANCT. ANCT is actually a stable coin, which you wouldn't take a flyer on a stable coin because they're stable. They don't really move much. But in that crypto space, if you're looking at Anchor, what Anchor is, is it's really a, it's almost kind of like doing what Celsius is doing or Uniswap or some of these other protocols that are on Ethereum. So I'm not really that big on it, honestly. It doesn't, I don't see it having a huge run. And let me just go into, it's ANC is the ticker symbol. And we'll go into, uh, we'll do that on KuCoin since that's one of their major exchanges. So there's your ANC token, right? That's So it's not ANCT, it's just ANC is the protocol token for this one. And you know, chart wise, does this look good to anybody? Does that look good? I'm looking at this one going, it doesn't look very good. Yeah, it's coming down to its moving average here, which I have at 100, but that chart formation just doesn't look very good. And that doesn't, that shouldn't be your only factor here in determining whether you want to be buying this or not. But, you know, do you think it's going to be up to your, your five, six, seven, eight? Well, if it does, it needs to do something, right? It has to serve a purpose and have a, uh, a prospect, unless you're looking for something like Shiba Inu, which again, doesn't really do anything. So, if you look at what they do, you know, they're basically a site where you can deposit your token and it's just for UST, right? That's for Terra. And this is built off of a the Terra network. So you could deposit your Terra and get 19.61%. That's that's impressive, right? That's pretty yeah, Margaret. I saw the head and shoulders too on that chart. I was gonna say something, but yep, look like it looks like a head and shoulders on this price chart right here. Boom, boom, and then you know, potential. Put a little line right across the bottom. It could be almost perfectly horizontal. Now, just about there. Of course, I could angle a little bit, but um, yeah, it doesn't look good technically. I look at what they're trying to accomplish, and yes, you can keep your crypto here and make money with it. You can get loans from them and get, you borrow money against yours. You can, um, it looks like staking here where you can actually stake and get Luna tokens, and then there's governance tokens as well. So while they're allowing you to do a few different things, it's not. Is this that groundbreaking of a product? You know, I don't I don't look at this and think, man, this is this is the new thing. Everyone's doing it. 
Now granted, we have a lot of this type of program already done on multiple different exchanges. For example, if you have Ethereum, there are protocols that do everything that this one is doing already for Ethereum. And this is just on Luna, or sorry, Terra. So this is built off the Terra network, which is a different blockchain, which is fine, right? Which is fine. You notice here, if you put in your ANC tokens plus the Terra coins and get a liquidity provider token, you can get 77% per year. So, I mean, obviously that's appealing, very appealing, but they're paying you in anchor tokens, which might not be that great, All right? Because you can see that their token has been drifting down here. So I don't see this as being one that's going to be a huge flyer. You know, would you keep a couple bucks of it in your portfolio? Yeah, okay. But I don't see it as being this one that's going to moon up to, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 dollars unless they really get a lot of popularity on their site, both from the earning the borrowing and the governing that they would potentially offer. So, you know, this is one that's basically just copying everybody else and saying, hey, park your money with us, we'll make you money. I'm looking for ones where the projects are bigger than that, right? I want somebody who's building their own ecosystem. I want somebody who's building interoperability between blockchains and things like that. I think those would be the ones that pop. I mean, and you saw Polkadot today, or some of you saw Polkadot today. Um, let me see if I can bring it up here. It was really, really rocking to the upside. Now, it's given back a bit, but, you know, you have uh, an 18% move up today. This is a one that does parachains where they're trying to link together the different blockchain products. So you've got, you know, Ethereum and Binance and, um, you know, Cardano and Polkadot saying, hey, we want to find a way to, to link you all together. You know, call it the universal language that ties everybody together. That was an interesting product for me, and it's been a, a very, very nice day with regards to Polkadot. Um, I don't know if I would call this mooning. Not quite the 99 billion percent that we saw um, a couple days ago on a Nano Dogecoin, whatever that stupid thing was. So that was one. So, um, yeah, I'm not a huge fan. I, I, it's not like I think it sucks. It's not like it's a shit coin. It's doing something, right? This actually has something. It's got a website, interactivity, you can, it's got liquidity pools, cool, that, that, that has some value. Like I say, it's not like Shibu Inu or, or Dogecoin, which don't really have any value. Okay, uh, last one, and this is for Manuel. Thank you so much for all the uh, contributions, support, and yes, I would always love to drink some Peruvian honey wine, why not? Manuel says, I wanted to get your thoughts on Chinese stocks. Uh, I, I think you meant to say Baidu, Alibaba, and FXI, as these were beaten down a lot. I would like to know how I can get more in-depth information, sources for these companies. If you go for China, would you be interested in small or medium caps? I don't really care either way for cap size. It doesn't bother me. It's about the company themselves. And I'll be honest, if you look at the charts of Alibaba and of um, Baidu, I mean, these guys have really been beaten down. I think Alibaba is, is a very good potential buy. Let me start with Baidu. So here's your Baidu chart. You know, the trend obviously is ugly. The only good thing is the most recent low, which happened October 4th and 5th, is higher than the previous. So it, it maybe it's stabilized a little bit. Maybe it's going to start to to rebound up here. Um, you know, I would maybe put a line in the sand for yourself and say, look, if it can close above this one, call it 170, right? And that would be perfect because not only would it be breaking this most recent high, it would also be breaking this moving average to the upside. So um, Baidu, you know, not my favorite company in the world, but I think it looks appealing for a long-term hold. Now, here's where I like BABA. BABA, look, look at this previous high. So you go all the way back into October of last year. So a one-year period of time, this thing was trading at $320. It dropped all the way down to $138. You know, is Alibaba going away? I do not think so. Um, the challenge right now is if you look at the acceleration, how quickly this is tanking. Notice how price has really extended away from these moving averages, or this moving average in particular is the 100. It really has pulled away. Now, granted, it has been a beautiful bounce over the last week, but does that mean that this downtrend is done and you start buying it? That's a very risky trade. Very risky trade. So, I personally think if you're going to hold Alibaba long term, oh, Rob, thank you so much, man. You're awesome. <laughs> you're number one, Rob. No, you're number one. Thank you for that, Rob. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, you look at where it fell into, it, to me, it really wasn't in any strong demand zone that would have caused this bounce. I think it's just uh, that, that way oversold situation. One thing that I do like to look at is volume. 
And this has been one that's repeatedly been asked to me. I love when I see really aggressive sell-offs like this and then climactic volume, kind of like you saw back here in August, the end of August. It was a really sharp sell-off on huge volume. That would have been a buy point for me. Of course, as you can see, probably would have stopped me out on this next move down. But I like buying real climactic volumes uh, against the trend. So yeah, I like Alibaba long term. I'm I'm a fan. I'm a I'm a shopper at Alibaba, and I think that they've got great potential. It's just right now you're dealing with major supply chain disruptions and shipping. So you know I told you about those e-bikes from China. Well, right now those things have gone up significantly in price because of the shipping, and of course people like myself who might have bought some more are now going. You know what? I'm not going to buy any more right now, and that's going to hurt those vendors from Alibaba, and of course hurt their profits. So. I think there will come a time, per the discussion we had yesterday, where all of a sudden we get the shipping back to normal. You know, Elon Musk citing that they're building all these more more boats and factories and all that stuff. That's all going to take some time to to get to market, and it's going to take time to get that impact on our markets. Um, not necessarily impact on our markets, but to get that supply moving again. When it does, these could be some very very good. Um, plays for Chinese stocks. Uh, you wanted FXI and JD was what I'm seeing from others. So FXI is obviously a broader way to trade it, right? You're trading a much bigger index. Um, it doesn't look as appealing as the the other ones, but still downtrend, lower highs, lower lows. This one right now, I'm not liking. Why? Simply because it's making lower highs, lower lows. You looked at Baidu, it's making lower highs, but it's making higher lows. So this one looks the most appealing simply from a potential breakout above 170. And then BABA, just because I'm biased, um, I would probably wait a little bit. If you can get a price that moves up above this, was it 178 level? Then I, then I, you know you start thinking this could be the bottom put in, but it's still making lower lows and lower highs, so it doesn't look as great. Um, let's see. I appreciate it. Uh, those e-bikes are so popular here in Atlantic City. Oh, yeah. Here in Southern California as well. I mean, I love riding them around. But, man, you have to be so careful. I mean, ours do 30 miles an hour. And without a helmet, man, you crash. <laughs> it's not a pretty picture. Uh, let's see. JD.com. All right. Out of all the ones we looked at, th doesn't this look better? It's not making as uh, significant of lows. It's stabilized a bit. And now it looks like it's actually starting to make some higher lows and potentially some higher highs. And importantly, you see the 100 period moving average is curling back up. So of all of the ones we just looked at, Alibaba, Baidu, FXI, and JD, this one looks the best. Simply because of uh, the current move and how everything's pointing the upside. I like the chart personally, just from my perspective. I like Baidu's chart because I'm a big fan of ascending triangles. And that's kind of the pattern that's forming here on it. If we were to draw a line across the bottoms here. All right, so we'll just draw right through here. It's it's not a sharp ascending triangle, but you guys get the point. It feels like it's stabilized, smacking its head against this wall. These ones become very easy to build trades around. I can simply say, buy long if I get a close above 170, put a stop loss target, boom, set and forget order, and uh, worry about it another day. I'll let you know. I may actually um, jump on Baidu if it gets above 170, but we'll have to wait and see. Right now we're at 163 and change. Cool. There you go, Katut. That's JD. Also for Adam, you guys requested, you shall receive. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Yeah, I saw that. I want to I want to check and verify that, Rob. I saw the Fed was talking about slowing down. We, we actually mentioned them slowing down in October, right? We talked about, not only did we talk about the Fed tapering their purchases, we talked about them also, um, uh, that they're not raising rates. God, I'm reading the chats. So all of a sudden, my brain skipped. Um but the Fed was talking about, yeah, potentially um, raising rates here soon. And then we have the Bitcoin ETF and we have the uh, tapering of the Fed purchases expected to happen in October. Well, looks like we're getting the Fed tapering a little bit. I um, kind of did that one discreetly, but I'm going to check and make sure that one. What about Algo? All right. Well, we'll do that one and I'll wrap up here and go through some economic analysis for tomorrow. Here's Algorand. Price chart doesn't look great. It's really what we call a symmetrical triangle. You've got lower highs and you have higher lows. So it's compressing. Um, I'm I'm long-term bullish on Algorand just because I, I have this feeling that Charles Hoskinson is going to go and do something with them and really start to, uh, to help out um, Algorand because I think he really likes the guy, which is kind of funny. But um, yeah, uh, that's, that's it. I, I don't think the chart is anything special. It just looks like compression of price right now. All right, let me go through the announcements for Manana. 
Here's what we've got cooking for tomorrow. Now, of course, we had consumer price index today. We're gonna have producer price index tomorrow. And notice they're expecting it to drop. Uh, I find it interesting that if they do drop, um, you know, where, where do we stand? Um, if they drop on PPI, then that might justify a slight increase that we saw today in CPI. Although I, I just don't see costs dropping. I, I'm look everything I see shows prices are rising. So that would be a really important one to watch an hour before market opens tomorrow. You also have later on in the day crude oil inventories, which as you guys have been watching crude oil, um, that has been a very popular one. A little bit of a down day today. Here is crude oil. Uh, you know, still looking really strong. It would not surprise me to see a retest of this 7750 mark and then a, then bounce back up. Uh, let's see, what else do I have for you? Our earnings for tomorrow. Boom, boom. Earnings, Bank of America, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, U.S. Bancorp. More financials and big financials tomorrow. You also have Alcoa for anybody in the metal space uh, and United Health Group and Walgreens Boots Alliance. That's who's reporting earnings tomorrow. All right, um, NJ, you said debating getting an e-bike or a scooter. I'll tell you what, you should get the ones I got because they fold up into a very small little package and they're really stable. You get the scooters, I don't know. Eh, what are you gonna, it's, it's tiny. You can't really go too long at distances. I don't know. I feel like the, the bike was the way to go. I love the folding version as well. I can, I can send you a link if you want to um, the company that I got them from and maybe they have distribution on the East Coast. I think you're in Atlantic City, you said. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me. Tomorrow, I've got Wendell. Mr. Brandon Wendell will be the guest on tomorrow's show. I'm not sure what we're going to talk about. You guys can definitely help us with that discussion. You have my email on the screen, which is tradermerlin at gmail.com. And many of you sending in comments and questions. So thank you for those that do. Um, I always love the participation, the feedback. You guys give me topic ideas. For example, today's show um, was predominantly because of Jeff's question about Don Chain Channel. And, you know, my summary of it would be, yeah, they're cool. They work. Um, but I don't think you should put your emphasis exclusively on the Don Chain channel or Bollinger's or MACD or RSI. It's decision support. It's kind of that second piece that helps you, um, I guess, confirm decisions. Which bike? Uh, let's see. Hey, real interview, Les. Right? It's <laughs> You're only an hour into it, man. That's a five-hour interview, but Charles Hoskinson, man, I think he's, he's a very special dude. Um, let's see. I'll show you the bikes here. I think it's Vituvia bike. So here is, I'll bring it onto the side. These are the bikes that I got. And so I bought um, Vituvia and you can go to the Vituvia bike. If you go through this site, you, you pay a lot more. And if you, if you are gonna go and buy them, you know, negotiate. Um, I have these two models here in the middle. You know, they say they're $12.99. Uh, you can get them down to probably Probably for 900 if you if you negotiate, maybe lower, but uh, I initially got mine for 800. Love them, they are great. They split in half, they fold. They're fat tire, 20 inch tire bikes. They do 30 miles an hour, and you can probably do I'm guessing probably 30 or 40 miles on the bike. So I can ride long distances, and you can see how those look. So I feel like I'm a salesman for the bike right now, but yeah, I love them. I think they're absolutely fantastic bikes, but. I thought they'd be cheap garbage, you know, because they're from China. You're like, ah, oh, this is not going to be a really good buy because they'd be kind of crappy. Psh, love them. They're great. Okay. Um, cool. Awesome, guys. I'm oh, sorry for a little sales pitch at the end. Of course, I don't get any royalties from these bike companies. Maybe I should start a bike business as well. Uh, thank you guys so much for all the participation. Those that sent in donations today, Rob, I appreciate that as well as NJ. Thank you guys so much. Um, if you have comments, questions, feedback, send them in to me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. For those of you in Crypto Investor Live, I'll see you tomorrow morning. And uh, we'll have all kinds of fun to talk about with Polkadot and other things tomorrow. All right, guys, that's going to do it. I will see you all manana with Brandon Wendell. Take care.